don't think I lost them. Somebody just peed on me. All right, let me see. You might have hit the wrong button. Yeah, you're in here. Sand view. There All right, go. here we go. Here we go. A little bit of technical issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we go. Content share. Speaking. There. There you go. Okay, everyone. Hey, we've got the issue solved, but I call this presentation the Republic of Fashion because with royalty like in France, England, other countries in Europe in the 18th century, that wasn't really much of a problem. Uh, but in the United States, because of our unique form of government, the first lady had to have some sort of sense of style to have foreign people take this seriously, but also still to exemplify this new form of government. And so we'll see how some of our first ladies, um, you know, succeeded in a few times where they failed. So let's get, let's get going. Okay, well, Martha Washington was the template and Abigail Adams said she was plain in her dress, but that plainness is the best of every article. And on average, she spent several hundred dollars a year on clothing, hairdressing, jewelry, and uh, she actually became the foundation of every first lady to come. Um, our next fashion plate was Dolly Madison. And uh, she did have some criticism. Uh, in fact, um, Abigail Adams, who was of another party, uh, described her low cut dresses, gowns, as she described her, that she looked like a nursing mother. <laughs> and uh, so, and also she was wearing rouge, uh, but even uh, Abigail had to concede that it's said that Mrs. Madison is said to rouge, but uh, it has not been seen by my eyes. So I think it's not true. So giving her her due, but uh, Dolly was also criticized for uh, having foreign made gowns instead of American made gowns, which was a huge issue back back in those days. In fact, uh, there was a, a wonderful story about uh, the American council in Bordeaux, his name was William Lee. He, he, he grumbled, he did nothing but waddle around Paris and cut from the magazines of fashion shopping for Dolly. And she even got her husband mad at her once because the import duty fee on her gowns was a whopping 2,000 bucks. <laughs> so that, that, that was a bit of an issue. Uh, now this is sort of a mystery involving one of her gowns. This gown you see here was left to her niece upon her death in 1849. And legend says it was made from the drapery she had saved from the White House, from the principal audience room, which is now the blue room. And there is the letter she wrote to her sister saying that the draperies and uh, the portrait of Gilbert, by Gilbert Stewart of President Washington in the East Room, where it still is today, was also carried away to safety. Now, the Smithsonian Institution borrowed a swatch from the DAR Museum, who claimed it was given to them as being made from these draperies like this gown. Unfortunately, they did not match. The swatch they had was satin and this was velvet. 
So whether this really came from the draperies, there's no way of knowing. However, it was made in the right period between 1810 and 1820. And uh, there had to be a reason why she kept it for her entire life and left it to someone. So that's, that's the, the mystery about the draperies. Now, Elizabeth Monroe, she really didn't have Dolly's people qualities which were really important because the White House was totally burned down and had to be restored. And it took three years and everyone was eager to be received by Mrs. Bad uh, Mrs. Monroe. But uh, one guest did this, uh, describe her as an extremely handsome wo woman. Now, Louisa Catherine Adams, she was it's rather interesting because she was a naturalized American who was raised in Europe and she was our first foreign born first lady and uh, she was criticized by American women uh, for her continental style and clothing and her manners and uh, it, it did definitely bothered some people at the time she took refuge from political life by actually raising her own silkworms and she used the, it for her personal sewing. Now, Angelica Van Buren, uh, she, her style of dress thought, a lot of people thought it was a little too queen-like. They used to actually have a term for it, they called it queen fever in those days. And, uh, that's that's an example of how she would uh, how she would dress. Now, Julia Tyler is interesting. She actually appeared in a fashion ad, and here she is with a, a young man, and the stores in the back, and the, the purse she's holding describes that the stores were uh, had. Uh, top grade uh, materials, the best of uh, everything, and they were they were wonderfully cheap. And uh, she became the first first lady ever to have her photograph taken, and that's her right there. And uh, she was sort of interesting. She got very very criticized because she would actually uh, receive with twelve young friends of hers. They were all dressed alike. And uh, wa uh, Washington unofficially dubbed them the Vestal Virgins. And she wore a headdress that looked sort of like a crown. Her chair was sort of golden and throne like, and it was on a raised dais. <laughs> so that, that really sort of bothered some people. But uh, she did actively. Uh, Court the press that she was the very first first lady ever to do that. But it was really funny with the ad because they didn't even use her name. Uh, but down here, it's described as the Rose of Long Island and everybody knew who that was in New York. <laughs> now, Sarah Childress Polk, uh, she was it was not known to the general public at the time, but she was her husband's confidential secretary. And so she was in on a lot of things that, uh, like the Mexican War, a lot of issues, and was really funny. She became a great friend of Mrs. Madison, and the president formally conducted them around, both around the East Room in a formal reception. And Dolly was a really uh, good guide for Sarah, and she was also described as being a commanding uh, and attractive woman. Now, Harriet Lane, interestingly enough, she was one of the 12 women who served as White House hostess, official hostess, who were not married to a president. She was uh, President Buchanan's niece, and uh, she uh, it was, uh, considered to be one of the bells of Washington. And uh, one of the things is she sort of was active in the sense that we think a first lady should be now because 
She advocated for better treatment of Native Americans, which was very revolutionary for its time. And in a time when things were getting rather frayed between the Southern uh, people in Congress and Northern people in Congress, her uh, receptions sort of helped bring people together and keep everything going a little while longer. And she became known in the papers as the first lady. She was the very, very first first lady ever to be called that. And Mary Todd Lincoln, um, she was regarded by official Washington as a backwoods woman, but she wasn't. She was very well educated and she could speak French. And uh, she got criticized by her own husband because, and this is a marvelous story because you know how the men in your life sometimes dig themselves into a hole? Well, according to his secretary, she, he did. When he first saw her low cut bosom and her long tail, he exclaimed, the cat has a long tail tonight. <laughs> and he dug it down even further by observing that said, mother, if, uh, more of that tail were closer to the head. It might be in better style. <laughs> and uh, maybe he was right because a, a hostile Oregon sen a senator wrote to his wife describing her as, uh, you know, uh, uh, trailing around in a, a, a long train and a, a, a low cut bosom wearing a flower pot on her head. So uh, she didn't get all the credit she should have gotten. And she also had competition. This was her uh, biggest thorn in Mary Lincoln's side. Kay Chase, the, she was literally the Belle of Washington. She was the daughter of Lincoln's Secretary of the Treasury. And uh, she actually had a lot of animus with uh, uh, Mrs. Lincoln because she would deliberately schedule her dinners and her receptions the same time the White House did, which forced people to choose which was the more important to go to. Now, you can't talk about Mary Lincoln without talking about Elizabeth Keckley, her dressmaker. We actually have a nonfiction and a fiction book that sort of explores their relationship. And uh, Mrs. Keckley must have been extremely devoted to her because she accompanied Mary on this very sad trip to New York in 1867. Mary was increasingly having trouble controlling her volatile spending, and she thought uh, people would buy her old White House years uh, gowns, but nobody was interested. The styles were changing. They were finally made, but they were used, and uh, they didn't sell a single one. And that was actually Mrs. Lincoln's very last trip to New York. Now, Julia Grant, uh, this is a funny story. She actually managed to tour a silver mine in Virginia City. And this is her post White House years. And she really, really, truly didn't want to go, but she overheard her husband making a bet with one of the other men in the party that she would refuse the invitation. And there you see her, she didn't, she went in a, in a dress. <laughs> and Lucy Hayes, um, she actually became the very first presidential wife to actually shake hands of the public with her husband because before that they were, she was the first lady was always there, but they would never actually shake hands. And these were mammoth things. They would get like a thousand people a day. Uh, you know, most first gentlemen, first president, their hands were swollen <laughs> from so many hands they shook all day. And uh, so she actually had a padded glove made <laughs> to make it easier for her to do that. And uh, she's also our very first first lady to have a college degree. Now, Frances Cleveland was actually our very youngest, and she still is. She was 21 when she married the president, who was 43. She was actually his ward 
And part of his job was to make sure she was educated. And when he visited her in college, things just sort of clicked between them. And uh, so uh, she was a literal media sensation. And the Women's Christian Temperance Union asked her not to wear shoulderless gowns like that because they thought it was a bad influence on the young women of the nation. And she also affected styles by not intending to. It was a very dull summer. The president was away. Congress wasn't in session. And some reporter, in order to justify his job, put out on the AP wire that the first lady did not wear a bustle. And at the time, there were some 13,000 newspapers in the United States. And I'd say pretty much every one of them carried that story. And uh, it was so well known that years later, she confessed that the very next time she had to have a gown made, she had felt obliged to have it made without a bustle. <laughs> now, Caroline Harrison, she was considered to be a very attractive first lady, but it's really more for her deeds than her clothing sense. Because first of all, her all of her wardrobe was made in America, all of it. And uh, she also did a, a multitudes of other things. She oversaw uh, the renovation of the kitchens in the White House. She oversaw the electrification of the mansion from Gaslight. She was the chairperson for uh, the Johns Hopkins Hospital Fundraising Committee on the condition that women would be allowed as students. She actually retrieved China from other presidential administrations and she actually designed her administration to China, the only first lady ever to do that. And uh, she somehow found time to serve as the first president general of the DAR. <laughs> so she was a very busy woman. And this is Ida McKinley, and she was normally very retiring as a first lady, but she had to change her plan. She was going to have a Belgian lace gown, and instead she had it made of American lace. And um, she also uh, decided not to wear an egret feather, which were very popular then, and because she had provoked a rebuke from the Audubon Society. I mean, imagine getting a smackdown from a society of bird watchers. I mean, you just can't win sometimes. And this is Edith Roosevelt, um, a New York Society doyen, Mamie Fish described her sense of style. It said she dresses on $300 a year and she looks it. Uh, that would be over $8,000 today. And um, this is her official state portrait and I frankly can't see anything wrong with it. And this is Helen or Nellie Taft. She had lived in Manila when her husband served as governor general and she had acquired and worn the White House a native Philippine style dress known as a Barot Saya. And uh, according to this book, I read uh, a woman who spent 40 years in the White House and who actually was brought in as a teenager to uh, work in the White House during the Taft administration, said the staff said that uh, her time in Malacanian Palace in the Philippines and Manila had been a very, very big influence on Nellie. And our next one is Edith Galt Wilson. And um, it's sort of an interesting because uh, President Wilson was the very first president ever to leave the United States while he was in office and he when he said that he was going to the Paris Peace Conference, I mean, it was an extraordinary opportunity, but also a lot of pressure on their staff. They had to try and get the most the best outfits they possibly could so that they would not be outclassed by European royalty. So Anyway, this is what she and the president wore, the Longchamps races. 
Now, this is interesting. Florence Harding, uh, while her husband was president-elect, she uh, got invited to her seaplane ride. And here she is, gamely suiting up in a flight suit over her dress. And it's the first time a, a lady was reported wearing pants in public. Although there was always this rumor that uh, Ida McKinley had worn uh, pants in the residence. And actually, it was known that Lucy Hayes had uh, toured, also toured a silver mine and in pants, but it was not released to the press. So this is the first time the actual, uh, everyone in the country could see a first lady wearing pants. Uh, now, this is a picture of her inauguration gown, and it's really basically doing an intro to the jazz age to come. Now, there were some limited things uh, like uh, uh, Lou Henry Hoover and Eleanor Roosevelt. They were both uh, horsewomen and they both wore yachtbers, but there was a big sea change between them because uh, Mrs. Hoover had this taken informally in what is now Camp David and uh, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt actually posed on the south portico of the executive mansion. So that was a real sea change. And somewhere in the middle, uh, Grace Coolidge actually wore two culottes when she and her husband made a, a trip of the West. And, uh, but her husband wouldn't allow them to take a picture of it. So it, that didn't wind up in the papers. And here's Grace Coolidge. Uh, there she is posed in true jazz age style uh, with her beloved colleague, Rob Roy, as contrast. <laughs> now, this is really interesting. This is Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, Eleanor Morgenthau, and they're both wearing fur neck pieces. And strangely enough, this is the weird part. Nobody had a problem with this in the 1940s because it was the style. It was in the 1990s that it became a problem because uh, they had made uh, a statue in Washington of her husband. And uh, they decided they needed a companion because she was so much an important component of his actual you know, administration. And when they decided to have her pose in a neck piece like that, the animal rights people went berserk. I mean, they got so many letters and emails and everybody was getting really, really excited about it. So if you go to Washington and you go see those two statues, you will see as a compromise, they have her wearing a cloth coat, which was actually more indicative of her post White House United Nations years, because they were already in trouble with her husband's statue, because they didn't, they showed him in a wheelchair, but they didn't show the wheelchair the president is wearing a boat cloak. And if you look very carefully, you'll see a fold that was a, where you could just see like a hint of a wheel. <laughs> so they were already in trouble with, with all sorts of people about this. Now, Bess uh, Truman, she liked to dress in very simple, very matronly uh, conservative outfits. And this is the family portrait in 1946 with their daughter, Margaret, who was the mystery writer. You may perhaps remember that. And uh, it's, uh, someone who worked there said the seamstresses were always after her to allow them to make a suit or a gown that would match her uh, deep blue eyes. But having been in the Washington a long time, she would just always consider it for a moment, and then she would just always tell the seamstresses, well, you know, you can't go wrong in black. Now, Mary, uh, Mamie Eisenhower was totally different. I mean, she used to dress very, very young, and she was sort of criticized as Dolly and Mary Todd had, uh, Lincoln had been, and this gown had more than 3,000 beads. And uh, one of the things that, uh, and a very low neckline for a middle-aged woman, but she carried it off. 
And uh, one thing she did, which was really interesting, is that every time there was the state occasion, she would have she would dress in her entire outfit that afternoon. So if anything was wrong, if anything was loose, if anything was torn, it could all be fixed. So instead of waiting till the dinner there and it happens. Now Jacqueline Kennedy was very interesting because her style was uh, supposed to represent the new frontier ethos of her husband Jack's administration. And for instance, she wore very pale colors because they looked best on black and white television. And she almost literally froze to death on inauguration day because she wore a linen coat and it was freezing in Washington. Every woman there was wearing a fur coat, but I mean, while it may have been very uncomfortable for her, she definitely stood out. And even her father-in-law chipped in uh, cash to uh, keep her in her Oleg Cassini preferred designer outfits in order to enhance his son's administration. And uh, this is the pink Chanel suit that Jackie wore November 22nd, 1963. It's in the Smithsonian. And uh, she was given the opportunity to change before the plane left Dallas to go back to Washington. And she refused. She said, she said rather cryptically, and she would never explain it, but she said that I want them to see what they've done. And this was sort of an interesting choice for uh, Lady Bird Johnson because a lot of people thought her alpha was the Yellow Rose of Texas because she was a Texan. And, but her idea was totally different. Uh, this was only 14 months after Jack Kennedy's assassination. She felt it was still a very bittersweet time. She wanted to represent a color that would provide hope and, and that's why she chose the yellow. Now Pat Nixon, this is to she watching her husband's famous checker speech in 1952 because uh, the, he was accused of getting improper gifts that imperiled his vice presidency job. So he went on television and he explained that uh, my wife hat does not own a fur coat. She wears a good Republican cloth coat. <laughs> so, so coats became politicized. And this is them during their White House years. And her red wool coat was deliberately designed to find favor with their Chinese hosts. And I thought this was a cute picture of Betty Ford. Uh, this is her last official day in the White House and she posed in a dancer's pose on the, uh, her, the cabinet table where her husband was doing very, very various business affairs. But, uh, and she sort of helped popularize wearing sl uh, slacks uh, because she knew that's what young people were wearing, young women. Oh. Rosalind Carter, she really got slammed on this one because she wore a six-year-old gown to the inauguration. And they, they, this is what she had worn when her husband was inaugurated as governor of Georgia. She liked the gown and she felt that with a big recession on, that maybe that was more appropriate than having something brand new. And, but a lot of people criticized her. They said she wasn't taking her role as first lady seriously. And uh, a lot of people thought she had made a big, big mistake. Now, Nancy Reagan, on the other hand, I mean, she, with her designer, James Galliano, uh, they basically ushered in an, an era of Hollywood glamor, which, you know, in 19... Was quite welcome after the the whip inflation now an in austere 1970s, and uh, but there was a dark side to this because sometimes uh, the gowns uh, that she wore were not purchased; they were lent. 
uh, although the White House officially says they never actually borrow gowns, but you know everyone tries to keep real quiet about that. And uh, sometimes she didn't return them, or sometimes she didn't declare them as gifts, which the law says you have to do. So there, there was a little bit of a dark side. And Barbara, the Bush, she knew she couldn't fit into that high pro power profile Nancy Reagan did. So she chose something more conservative. And uh, this is her inauguration gown, very regal blue with her trademark white pearls. And Hillary Clinton, she got uh, uh, criticized. Uh, this is the purple was from uh, a local designer from Little Rock, and she wore it so because Arkansas had been very important to her her husband's career, and it was basically a recognition of where they came from. But a lot of people said they thought it was very dowdy, uh, and uh, but you know a lot of people also said it was also very regal. Now, for her second inauguration, she wore a more mainstream Oscar de la Renta outfit, and she got criticized again because they said, people said it was confusing. <laughs> and this is a nice picture of Laura Bush. She opted, like Hillary, she, Laura opted for a local designer for home state of Texas, and she also wore pearls like her mother-in-law, Barbara, so it gave, you know, uh, uh, red party pride, pearls, family pride. She, and she once said in her memoir, she said she had no idea how many dresses people expected her to buy as first lady. Now, Michelle Obama, she also chose a relatively unknown designer. Uh, she wore J. Crew on Jay Leno's program in 2008, and the, the white was supposed to be aspirational, and and uh, because it was very historic occasion, and here she is uh, in one of her trademark uh, uh, outfits because she was often criticized because of her, you know, uh, statuesque bearing and tone, bare arms. And I don't know, somehow bare arms got very political for some reason. Um, and, uh, uh, but she, she was just a very well-dressed woman. And uh, here's, you know, Melania Trump. I mean, the, this is the gown she wore uh, in January. This is how she saw in the new year 2020. Little did we all know what 2020 was going to be like. And you know, with her uh, constant uh, contact with the New York fashion industry, she always presents the very best uh, appearance. And she actually, believe it or not, uh, this gown was over four thousand dollars, but she bought it off the rack. You can actually buy this gown; it's not made especially for her. So, I hope everyone enjoyed this little romp showing which first ladies, what they wore, what it meant, and everything else like that. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Yeah. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, we can. I was just wondering if uh, if that if the uh, first lady's uh, dresses are still at the Smithsonian, uh, or has is was that a revolving exhibit that's moved on? Uh, no, uh, actually, it was closed for a while because uh, they felt that the 1960s era uh, was sort of outdated, and uh, they wanted to emphasize more some of the things they did rather than what they wore. So there is a brand new First Ladies Hall. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, if there's no other 
Yeah. Any other questions? You know, I'm here. <laughs> well, if there aren't any more questions, I do want to remind everybody that Tom has two more upcoming programs uh, in the month of August. On August 3rd, which is a Monday, also at 11, is called Homefront Cooking. And then two weeks later on the 17th, again a Monday, and again at 11 o'clock, we have the Gardens of DuPont. We welcome everyone to sign up for that. We look forward to seeing you. Oh yeah, and uh, the home front kitchen in order to not be too obscure, it's about how Americans cope with food rationing in the Second World War and what it meant, how important it was. And uh, the gardens of DuPont uh, uh, are a tour of the gardens I mean, I should really work for Visit Delaware. I mean, I gave them a really good program, <laughs> but I think you'll, I think everyone will enjoy both of them. Beautiful. Okay, thanks again. We'll see ya. All right, bye-bye. Okay, I'm closing down. <laughs>